Hi guys, welcome back to my channel. If you're new around here, my name is Nicole and today it's starting to feel like fall. Finally! Today is official first day of fall, so it's probably a good thing that it's starting to feel that way, right? And now that I say that, the temperature is probably going to shoot through the roof and it's going to be hot again because <laughs> we're just getting a tease. Anyway, since it feels like fall, I think today we should make cinnamon rolls because yes, a lot of people like pumpkin and all that in the fall. I'm sorry, cinnamon rolls are very comforting and fall brings comfort. So today we're going to be making cinnamon rolls. Now, if you want a pumpkin recipe, check out the, the link up here. I don't know which side it goes to. Um, Anyway, I do have pumpkin from last year. We made pumpkin muffins. They were amazing. I might have to make them again. And I also bought some pumpkins that you can make your own pumpkin puree. We're going to be doing that this week-ish. I don't know when. Um, so stay tuned for that if you really like the pumpkin. But today is cinnamon roll day. And I don't know about the rest of you, but this shirt right here, it always attracts stuff. They, I cannot wear it without getting stains on it. Please somebody tell me I'm not alone on this. Okay? Like, I wear this shirt, I have to change it. Which is what I'm getting ready to go do. Okay, so stick around for the cinnamon rolls because they are amazing. And let's get to it. So the first thing you want to do is scald one cup of milk. Now what does it mean to scald? Basically, you are just going to heat your milk up to the point just below boiling. You do not want it to boil, but you want to bring it all the way up and then you bring the heat back down. So that's scalding your milk. Make sure to keep stirring your milk so that you don't scald it. And basically, if you boil it, you're going to significantly lessen the milk's nutritional value. So in simple words, if you boil milk past 212 degrees Fahrenheit or 100 degrees Celsius for more than 10 minutes, basically you are depleting the essential nutrients in pasteurized milk. My butter was not at room temperature, so adding the scalded milk to my butter helped soften my butter and it also helped cool down the milk because you do not want to pour your yeast onto extremely hot milk so that allowed the milk to cool down quicker. So what we want to do is we want to combine our milk, our shortening, and our sugar together. Stir it together and allow it to cool down until it is lukewarm so that we don't kill our yeast. You do need your mixture to be warm because the warmth is what activates your yeast. However, you don't want it to be too hot. So usually they say the optimal temperature is between body temperature, which is 98.6, and about 110 degrees. Now one way that I like to sit there and test to see how warm my actual water yeast mixture is, is if I can stick my finger down into it and it doesn't burn me, but I can still feel it, that's about right. Now it's time to let the yeast bloom for about five minutes. Once the yeast has bloomed, we're going to go ahead and turn on the mixer and stir it in well. Then we're going to add three eggs. It is also time to stir in the one teaspoon of salt. Salt and yeast don't always play well together, so you definitely do not want to put one on top of the other. Now is the time to add four and a half cups of flour. I am using a half cup measure, that way I can watch how the flour is reacting to the liquids because you don't want your dough to be too sticky nor do you want it to be too dry and this allows me to kind of read the dough as it works together. Humidity has a large effect on how dough reacts to the different water quantities that it needs. On a humid day, you may have to add more flour. On a dry day, you may have to add more liquid. As I got to watching this, I realized that my dough was just not coming together. And so I went ahead and I added another quarter of a cup and then an additional quarter of a cup. So I wound up having to add a whole half a cup more to get my dough to come together. Once the dough finally came together, I used a trick that my grandma always says, which is to let the mixer run for 10 minutes. She said it will help the dough come together and 
it makes a more uniform dough. Now, if you are going to do this by hand, you probably want to mix for at least five to 10 minutes on your counter. Since I used my mixer, I let it run for 10 minutes. In fact, I set a 10 minute timer. And then eventually I decided to go ahead and switch from my paddle hook to the dough hook. And if anybody has been around here any time at all, you know I hate the dough hook, but the dough hook finally worked for me but it was because I started with the paddle first. The other thing I want to tell you is if you're letting the mixer do the work for you, you probably should hold your mixer. Back in about 2015 or so, my husband and I were making Thanksgiving dinner and he was making rolls and he asked me to watch the mixer. Then he came back to it and when he did, our little one started crying so I went over to take care of her and neither one of us were watching the mixer when the mixer fell off the counter. I can tell you that the mixer survived. It put a dent in the bowl and it took a gouge out of my floor, but otherwise the mixer survived. So take it for what it's worth, but I would probably hold the mixer. <laughs> This is a different mixer than that one, but you hear that clanking? I'm not sure what's causing that clanking. I stopped it to make sure that my dough hook was attached correctly, and it is, so I'm not sure what that clanking sound is. If anybody knows, please let me know, because it's kind of annoying, and it kind of makes me afraid that something's gonna happen. Once the mixer has done its 10 minutes of kneading, then it is time to go ahead and pull out the dough hook, put your dough into a greased bowl to proof. Now, I'm doing what my grandma always did, which is you pull the dough out of the bowl you just mixed it in, put a little oil into it, and go ahead and put your dough back into the same bowl. Why dirty up another bowl? So, the reason for the oil is basically to help keep a weird film from developing on your dough. So, you cover your dough in the oil, then you go ahead and you put a blanket over it to keep it warm and put it in a warm spot for an hour. Now, I went back and put some cling wrap underneath my towel just to make sure that it was good and warm. One hour later, or doubled in size, it is time to put your dough out on either a floured surface or on a piece of parchment. I chose to go the parchment route so I didn't add in too much extra flour. Gravity, hopefully do its thing. <laughs> Maybe not. I don't know. <laughs> oh, 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 we're going, we're going, we're going. to roll your dough out into a rectangle and at this point I had such a case of the giggles I guess because it took forever for that to fall out of the bowl I don't know now I usually have a hard time rolling my dough into whatever shape it's supposed to be you want a circle I can do a rectangle you want a rectangle mine goes into a circle so I got my bench scraper or my dough scraper or whatever you would like to call it out to try and help make sure that it was going into a rectangle and then I decided to drop it on the floor so I had to find another one once you get the shape of your dough then it is time to add the butter now I've had the best luck putting very room temperature softened butter on and if you dot it all around in pats it makes it easier to spread I used just a little bit more than a quarter of a cup because that's what I had sitting there and I just used everything I had. That was about a half a stick plus about a tablespoon or so, but a quarter of a cup would have been perfectly fine. 
and your hands make the best tools for spreading the butter, just remember to use the Dawn to get it off your hands because regular soap wasn't even cutting through the butter on my hands. Now it's time to add the sugar and cinnamon. I went ahead and I added about a third of a cup of regular sugar and about a quarter cup of brown sugar just to give some different notes in the center filling. And then of course you can't forget the thing that gives them part of their name, cinnamon. I added a heaping tablespoon of cinnamon to my center filling. Now it's time to do the other part of the name, the roll part. You want to keep it as tight of a roll as you can, so definitely start out very, very small and tight and just work your way and use it in like a typewriter motion back and forth and just barely make any moves so that you can keep it as tight as possible. Make sure to seal off the end to keep it in the roll shape. Now then, use your bench scrape, a knife, or non-flavored dental floss, your cutter of choice to cut into 12 even pieces. The more even the cut, the more even the bake. We are going to place these in a 9 by 13 pan that has been greased. I didn't have any room temperature butter so I went ahead and I used my oil here. This thing is amazing. You can find them on Amazon. This particular one is Pampered Chef but you can use any oil you want. I like to put the end pieces with the cut side up. It just makes them look more uniform when they bake and I tend to put them together. Then you just want to basically make four rows of three. When I put those end pieces, they are a little bit smaller usually, so I'll put some of the bigger middle pieces in by the small pieces so that when they bake, they bake kind of uniformly. Now it is time to cover them with a tea towel and let them rise again. I'm going to turn the light on my, in my oven, but no heat, and let them sit in there. That extra little heat from the light will help them rise. They need to sit and rise for 20 to 40 minutes. Once they have done their second proofing, it is time to pull them out of the oven and preheat your oven to 375 degrees. Then you are going to place your pan into the oven and allow them to bake for 15 to 20 minutes or until they are fully cooked through. Beepity boo beepity boo beepity boo! Once the cinnamon rolls come out of the oven, it is time to make the icing. First, add a quarter of a cup of room temperature softened butter to your mixing bowl. To that, you want to add four ounces or a half a block of cr softened cream cheese. Use your hand mixer to mix those together. Next, add a splash of vanilla. I don't measure vanilla, I use it as my heart pleases. So you can do what you want. Then we're gonna add in one cup of powdered sugar. Remember, I keep a quarter cup in my powdered sugar. You could also add in a tablespoon of milk if you wanted to thin it out, but I wanted my icing to be thicker because I knew I was putting these on my warm cinnamon rolls. I wanted the icing to hold up. Let's try this thing. Mmm. It is so good. Gooey and gooey. I don't know if you can see inside of there. Mmm. Okay. I'm gonna go eat now. Bye.
at that. He is in here thinking he's gonna get one too. Not thinking, knowing. Oh, and he's going from middle. Like, dead middle. Yeah. Duh. An animal? Why? My hands. Oh. Do you want a fork? Yum. I do. Ah! Um. <laughs> it's terrible, right? It's disgusting. We should not serve these to other people. <laughs> we'll just eat them all. Let's get up close and personal. You see this spot right here? Oops, right there. I cannot get that out of the shirt. Like it's permanently ingrained in this shirt for some reason. I don't know what its problem is. I also have whatever that is. <laughs> Ugh, I swear I cannot wear this shirt without getting something on it every time. Okay. Mm-hmm. <laughs>